The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and we're coming to you live and around the world on the Talk Star Radio Network and our fine broadcast to affiliates across Canada, the United States, Central America, the Caribbean, South America, the Pacific Rim, Asia, and Europe. Our toll-free number is one 877 Now, that is toll-free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii. Our email address is exxon at talkstarradio.com. On MSN Messenger, talkstarradio at hotmail.com. And our website, www.exxonradio.com. My guest this hour is Reverend Daniel Gargulio. Uh, we're going to be talking about occult investigations. Uh, Reverend Daniel is a practitioner of esoteric Christianity, holds ordination in several religious organizations, and has lectured on metaphysics at the university level. He resides in Baltimore, Maryland, where his lifelong researcher research continues into the realms of exorcism, demonology, and psychic phenomena. And Daniel Reverend, uh, Dan, uh, Reverend Daniel, welcome to the show. Good evening. How are you tonight, sir? I'm well. Uh, Reverend, I was wondering if you could uh, please explain to us how you became an ordained minister or an ordained priest. Well, it happened through a series of rather unusual circumstances for such a thing, I would say. In the early 1990s, I became associated with a metaphysical bookstore in Allentown, Pennsylvania called Cosmic Visions Limited, which was uh, run by a gentleman named Jay Solomon, who was very well known in the metaphysical field at that time. And through um, his bookstore and other activities that he had in the area, I became acquainted with another gentleman named Bishop Jason Fox, who was what is termed an Episcopi Vagante, or Wandering Bishop. He had been ordained as a minister originally as a priest and then bishop in the Byzantine Catholic Church, but had, had left to go on his own while maintaining his ordination uh, the sacramental powers of the ordination, because according to Catholic doctrine, a priest always uh, retains the sacramental powers, and a bishop can ordain others into the priesthood. And through Bishop Fox, who recognized uh, what he termed abilities in, in me of spiritual discernment and so forth, invited me into the priesthood and the uh, apostolic lineage, the Byzantine apostolic lineage. Now, what is the, or, uh, the origin of your ordained name, Gargilio or Gargilio? Gargilio. Gargilio is based on the word uh, gargoyle, which is uh, the uh, unusual-looking stone creature's often seen on the Gothic cathedral, mm -hmm. who are believed to be actual guardians against evil. This, the idea originally comes from a legendary story in the life of St. Romanus, who was the bishop of Rouen, France, during the 7th century, who, according to the story, delivered the town from a gigantic creature, a sort of dragon called uh, La Gugil, meaning the gurgler, because it's viewed scalding water out of his mouth, and through prayer and the rites of exorcism, uh, Saint then Bishop Romanus was able to deliver the town and bring the creature under control where it became a, a guardian against evil and all of the uh, gargoyle 
statues are based on that, basically. So basically, you are a, a protector of religion. In a sense, that's one of the things that I, I tend to do. Uh, religion, true religion, not necessarily everything that you see portrayed as organized religion in the modern world would mm-hmm. meet with everything in my approval, but I do believe that religion is a good thing, a necessary thing, and basically does good for the human race. Reverend Daniel Gargilio is our special guest, and we will be back on the other side of this two-minute break. If you'd like to visit uh, Reverend Daniel Gargilio's website, it's www. Gargilio.com. That's G A R G U I L L I O dot com. And we'll be back on the other side talking about occult investigations, demonology, psychic phenomenon, and exorcism when we return here to the X Zone on Talkstar. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi Fi, you can still listen to the X Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X Minus One, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213 401 0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. The Reverend Daniel Gargilio is our special guest. His website is www.gargilio.com. Dot com and uh, Reverend Daniel, what is esoteric Christianity? Esoteric Christianity is a belief that there is more to Christian doctrine and especially to the Holy Scriptures and the interpretation of the Holy Scriptures than is usually portrayed to the public by organized religion. Basically, is, is one way of stating it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ancient belief of uh, Gnosticism was one sort of esoteric Christianity, but by far not the only one. How different is real religion from the religion that we know? Real religion is concerned with the betterment of humanity, quite simply. Uh, is not based around far too much of what you see in organized religion uh, these days. Uh, ministers and priests of organized religion more interested in, of course, money-making and getting involved in uh, politics for their own reasons rather than for the betterment of humanity. That's uh, how I would express that. Plus, uh, I would say religion is a bit more esoteric Christianity anyway, in a religious context, is more intellectually based than uh, the more external forms of religion, which are more emotionally based. What is, um, what is one great mystery of biblical interpretation you could uh, reveal and share with us? One of my personal favorites is in uh, the Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter, the fifth verse, says the light shines in darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. In the uh, Latin, it's lucere and tenebris lucis, et tenebris non comprendis. And the interesting thing there is the mix of, of present and past tense. The light shines in darkness, present tense, and the darkness did not comprehend it, past tense. Mm-hmm. And that reveals the mystery that light, things of God, things of goodness, exist outside of the time-space continuum, while darkness, the things of evil, the evil spirits, are bound up in matter, in time and space. That's one of the mysteries that 
I can reveal, which is a favorite of mine. Do you think that we are in the apocalyptic end times as depicted in the book of Revelations? In one sense, we have to remember that the end times began with the coming of the Messiah, which was in Christian belief, of course, was 2,000 years ago with Jesus Christ. But beyond that, I would say we are moving into that era, I, I do believe, personally, the, the signs are there. Does your belief in, apoca in the apocalypse differ than the belief by so many others in organized religion that it is going to be the end of the world? I have some definite differences in belief from what they think. I, I don't think that it's going to be a great uh, tragedy in the end. Uh, good will triumph, of course, and uh, the forces of darkness will be destroyed. The sad thing is what's going to happen in the, the meantime when many people, even well-meaning good uh, Christian and other good religious people, good uh, Jews, Muslims, and other good religious people are going to follow the Antichrist, unfortunately thinking that he is Christ or the Messiah of the various religions. That's the great tragedy, I think, of the coming apocalypse. If the end times are near, Reverend, do you believe that the Antichrist is already on this planet? I believe that it's, it's very possible, yes. I wouldn't say definitely. We're not to say that. No human being can know that, but um, I think it is possible, yes. What is your interpretation, sir, of the number 666? The uh, basic interpretation is that uh, the number 7, of course, is the number... In biblical numerology, the number of perfection. So the number 666 falls short of it uh, three times, once for each uh, of what would otherwise be the Holy Trinity. Mm -hmm. So the 666 basically represents the, the diabolical um, parody of the Holy Trinity. Is it then... Miscons misconstrued as the mark of the beast? No, because it, it it is the mark of the beast. Going back to when the time the book of Revelation was was written, mm -hmm. uh, 666 was the 666 was the numero numerological equivalent of the name uh, Nero Caesar when written in Hebrew. And uh, Nero, of course, being the great persecutor of Christianity during the first century A.D., was a type of Antichrist who will be a great persecutor of all things good while portraying himself as the Messiah during the end times. How, sir, do you believe we will know the end times are here? One thing is to know how to identify the Antichrist when he reveals himself. For one thing is, I believe that the vast majority of people will believe that he is Jesus Christ, because the word Antichrist, Antichristos, in the original Greek of the New Testament, means not only against Christ, but it also means before Christ, as in coming before Christ, and instead of Christ. And the Antichrist will appear before Christ, and I believe that those who believe in the so-called uh, rapture theory, mm -hmm. a rapture doctrine, who believe that Christ is coming first are in serious danger of ending up worshipping the Antichrist. You have done occult investigations, and I was wondering if you could tell us your most... Um, the case that shook you the most when it comes to demonology, and is demonology dealing with Satan directly? Demonology is uh, the study of the demonic realm. It goes back to the, 
the Middle Ages when uh, the priests of the uh, Catholic Church would um, study the demonic realm in order to understand which demons may be uh, plaguing a person if they had perhaps uh, the desire to commit murder or uh, perverted sexual desires or various things of that sort. That's what uh, that's the origin of the term demonology, the, the study of demons, basically. Usually in the sense of uh, demonologists today use as a prelude to exorcism if, if possible. How many different demons are there? There are, at the very least, hundreds of thousands. I think, I think it's more likely millions. Uh, According to the uh, New Testament, the book of Revelation, the demons are one-third of the angels who fell with Satan when he was cast out of heaven, who followed Satan in his rebellion against God and were cast out with him. Now, what has happened to you, or what experience have you had when dealing with demons? I've been doing this as an occult investigator since 1984. I was very young at the time. I actually started, I was uh, 15, 15 years old. And uh, this was during the time when Satanism, especially what they called at the time self-styled Satanism, was becoming very popular among teenagers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew people at the time who were involved in such things and have seen it lead to very much the destruction of people's lives and to uh, drug addiction uh, and various forms of insanity, uh, crimes, committing of various crimes, both violent crimes and otherwise, and um, things of that sort. And I've also experienced over the years the uh, various supernatural manifestations of demonic possession and so forth, uh, levitation. I've heard the people speaking in unknown languages that they didn't know. That's one of the definite signs of possession. And uh, seen things like... Uh, Furniture move on its own, all of the classic things which people see in the movies and hope are just special effects do most of them at least actually occur. What does a demon look like? They can appear in, in various forms. Uh, the uh, frightening thing about it is as... Uh, uh, St. Paul said in the New Testament, uh, Satan himself can appear as an angel of light. And that's the most dangerous form. Many people who become involved with demons begin by thinking that they're actually involved with the Holy Spirit or angels or things of that sort. Reverend Daniel Gargilio is our special guest. Please stand by, Reverend. You and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. We will be back after the news and a brief commercial set. If you'd like to give us a call, Exxon Nation, ask the Reverend any questions about occult investigations, demonology, psychic phenomenon, or exorcisms, give me a call at one eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five. That's toll free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii at one eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five. The good Reverend and I will be back on the other side of this short commercial break with the news as the Exxon continues live and around the world, right here on the Talk Star Radio Network from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, 
at WPBN TV. For more information on the X Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka. X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Reverend Dan, uh, Daniel Gargulio is our special guest, www.gargulio.com. Uh, Reverend uh, Daniel, what is it like when a person is possessed. How can you can tell if they are possessed to the point that an exorcism is actually required? I would look for actual uh, supernatural manifestation of some sort. As I stated before, mm-hmm. levitation is fairly common and the things like the shaking of the, the bed, uh, the speaking in strange languages, like perhaps it's a person that's never studied Latin or Greek or something of that sort, and suddenly can speak it, and um, things of that sort that are the the classic examples of evidence of possession. The movie The Exorcist that came out a number of years ago. How close to reality was that movie? Actually, pretty close. William Peter Blatty actually did study a lot of the. Uh, traditions of the uh, Catholic Church involving uh, mm-hmm. exorcism and based it on a couple of uh, true cases, including the one case, fairly famous case now because of its use in the movie in the 1940s of a, it's actually a young boy who had an exorcism performed on him and a lot of the uh, incidents of the, exor- of the exorcist, the book and later the movie were based on that now, I was wondering if you could tell me what it was like when you did your very first exorcism. Well, as I have the, I was born with what St. Paul called the uh, gift of the discernment of spirits. I have the specific ability to feel the presence of an evil spirit and tell if it is an evil spirit and The thing that struck me about being in the presence of one or more evil spirits and continues to strike me about it is the incredible feeling of dread, the feeling of doom, and often I thought at first that this feeling was something they were trying to make the the other people feel in order to cause fear and so forth, but later it came to me that what I'm actually experiencing and what the fear that you may feel in the presence of such creatures is the deepest part of their soul because they know themselves that they are doomed to destruction, to uh, eternal, literal hell uh, in the end. And they let this out. They bring this to the people that they, that they possess and to those around them. Why would someone get possessed? There are uh, various reasons. The classic example, uh, on uh, not dabbling in the occult without knowledge of the thing but and things of that sort. So most often I have found the most common cause of possession is uh, child abuse, especially the sexual abuse of a child, because the 
pain, the psychological pain and trauma that a child will undergo on having been abused. And that way is something that the demonic spirits feed on because demonic spirits are basically disembodied psychic vampires and they feed on fear and on pain and suffering and there's no greater pain than that of a child who has been horribly abused. Is it more difficult to do an exorcism on a child than it is on an adult? Uh, I would say there would definitely be a point to saying that, yes, because it's very important, first of all, to make to make sure the person undergoes no uh, actual physical injury or anything mm-hmm. of that, that sort, because the demonic spirit will try to drive them to injure themselves. And uh, in the case of an adult, of course, you can get their permission to uh, strap them down or whatever as a mental patient the same with the same problem would be but with a, with a child that that of that of course can be a problem but um, it is more difficult also just because the child is, is innocent of any wrongdoing themselves and in the case of an adult they could you could get them to repent from whatever Mm-hmm. sin or evil that they've done that may have gotten them there while the child is suffering because of someone else's evil. So in that case as well, it, it is much more difficult, yes. Yeah. What do you take with you when you go on an exorcism, and how do you prepare yourself? The uh, basic tools of exorcism are, of course, crucifix, religious symbols of other, of other types, those who aren't practicing Catholics or Christians, the uh, Star of David, the Jewish religion, the Egyptian Ankh, the cross with the, the loop on the mm-hmm. top, most people have seen, was used as protection against evil even thousands of years before Christianity, an ancient Egyptian form of the cross connected to the god Osiris, and it is still is effective against evil. And, of course, holy water, water that has been blessed by a priest or minister, uh, uh, the uh, classic rites of exorcism, readings from the Holy Scripture, and all things of that sort. Are you in any danger when you, uh, when you perform an exorcism? <clears throat> Exorcists are in danger and in, in many different ways, especially psychological speaking, psychologically speaking. Uh, the philosopher uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, while wow. an atheist himself, certainly not, not a Christian or necessarily a believer in evil spirits, uh, said something which I think is very apt in discussing exorcism uh, his famous saying, if you wrestle with monsters, you may become a monster, and if you, when you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back into you. And uh, that is a good explanation of what can happen during exorcism, because it is very psychologically draining, and the spirits will go to any length to try to get the exorcist to lose his temper, to doubt his faith, and most of all to feel unworthy of, of God's grace or even to feel unworthy of being thought of as a decent human being. This is one of the attacks that the demonic spirits will often use. How long does the average exorcism take? Is it hours? Is it days? Is it weeks? They've been known to take everything from a few minutes, a few minutes, the saying of the basic prayers, to weeks and even months. And if the person is doing something that can invite the spirit back, it can be a process of years, even in some cases. It has been known to happen. 
so how do you prepare yourself for the exorcism, uh, Reverend? Uh, do, do you do you? I, I I know you pray, but how do you prepare yourself physically for the challenges that you're going to be facing? Well, basically, the way you would prepare yourself for any extremely draining activity is much as much uh, sleep and sleep as possible. You want to. Uh, not be hungry, but not be uh, uh, too filled with anything either. It's basically the same thing you would, you need. Basically, the same thing you would for any strenuous physical activity, as well as mental activity. So, uh, sleep as well as prayer and medica- meditation before the exorcism begins and basically I find breathing exercises to help to try to stay as calm as possible. That's the most important thing to not let the spirit mm-hmm. get to you in the case of when they attempt to play with your emotions. Tell me, have you ever has a spirit ever tried to possess you while you are exercising a spirit or a demon from another person? That is uh, very common, and while, while I can say it hasn't really worked with me, uh, that is a lot more common than people would think, and even some of the uh, saints of the church have been possessed. I mean, even after they were uh, Christians living, living a saintly life. I mean, demonic spirits are very uh, proficient finding ways in through weaknesses, psychological, mental weaknesses. So look for any opening if they've decided to target an individual. Since you joined the priesthood, how many exorcisms have you done? As far as full-scale exorcisms uh, that have taken the actual rights more profound, solemn rites of exorcism, uh, less than, no, around, around 100, I would say. Though as far as lesser exorcisms, like the small rite of exorcism written by Pope Leo XIII and saying prayers for people who believe they're troubled by evil spirits, uh, several hundred, because I get even just email requests every day for such things now that I'm online with it and all of that what goes with that. <clears throat> Where do these spirits or the demons go after they are exercised by you? The uh, goal of exorcism is to uh, send them back to hell, to perdition. The abyss, as it is called in the New Testament. There have been other examples, a famous example in the life of Christ when he was exercising demons and they asked him to send them into the uh, swine, the herd of swine that were feeding nearby, and, and Christ did so. And the, the swine immediately ran down and threw themselves over the cliff showing us that even uh, swine, pigs, know better than to have anything to do with demons. It's basically the moral of that story. Has Satan himself ever possessed a human, or does he leave this to the demonic realm? The greater demons, the ones we were called devils, of which Satan is one, tend to concentrate on larger figures, political figures in history. Examples would be, of course, like uh, Emperor Nero, Hitler, of course, um, more recently, perhaps perhaps Saddam Hussein, people of that sort, dictators, Stalin, Mm -hmm. perhaps uh, Pol Pot, people of that sort, are the people who are possessed by the greater demons of the names of Satan. 
We touched on this very briefly, Reverend, uh, the people who dabble with the occult. Now, there are many people these days who are taking up the occult and the paranormal as a hobby. What, are they putting themselves in danger? Well, I would in no way condemn anyone who wants to study the uh, uh, magic or Wicca, white witchcraft, or anything of that sort. But uh, I must warn people to be, you know, careful to study, not, not, to, not to just take it up as a hobby. Mm-hmm. But to take it up as a very serious study, as you would any study on on a scholarly level, and uh, I in no way condemn people who are occultists. There are some very good people who are occultists, and I don't believe it, it all leads to evil. I believe that what we call uh, magic, or even what we rather loosely call witchcraft, is a and not an immoral force, not a moral force, but an amoral force, which can be used for good or evil. But any sort of power can corrupt and can lead the person to use it for selfish means, which is an opening in itself for demonic influence. Reverend Daniel, uh, we have to take a, a commercial break. We'll be back on the other side. And when we come back from the news at the top of the hour, Jesse Kelsey will be joining me. He is an ast- he is a um, astronumerologist. And if you'd like to give us a call and speak to the Reverend, we've got about four minutes left at one eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five. And we'll be back on the other side as the Exxon continues on Talkstar. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Reverend Daniel Gargilio is our special guest, so www.gargilio.com. Um, what is the most gratifying aspect of the work that you do, uh, Reverend? To uh, help uh, the children who have been abused. That, that's really the most important thing to me when you really come down to it. That, that's something that's very important to me, and um, I respect anyone who works in that thing, that, that sort of realm, whether spiritually or otherwise, because uh, uh, children are just something I feel very protective towards. And uh, to help anyone who's been abused as a child, also adults, knowing what the uh, psychological scarring of that can be from having worked with so many people of that sort. That, that to me, is the most important thing. What can our listeners do, uh, Reverend, to combat evil and uh, the demonic possessions and the demonic forces that are out there? One of the most effective things is the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, who of course was the Archangel who cast Satan forth from heaven, and the prayer was written by Pope Leo XIII in the late 19th century. You can find it on my uh, website, the homepage of my website. I put it there, and I recommend anyone who's interested in being part of the fight against the forces of darkness to learn that prayer and repeat it as often as as they wish or feel the need to do so. Statistically speaking, uh, Reverend, are are possession cases up? Yes. uh, Recently, uh, I've seen a great uh, heightening in them. And uh, even the the current uh, Pope, even though the Catholic Church in recent years unfortunately has mostly kept silent about such things. The current Pope Benedict XVI is being said there are some rumblings underneath of the Vatican according to what some people have put out in the news recently that 
the Vatican is going to finally finally begin taking possession and exorcism very seriously again within the church. Why did they back off in the first place? Unfortunately, as I said, when with organized religion, I think they were just more concerned with public opinion. It seems like some uh, crazy medieval belief, and they just didn't want people to associate them with that. And unfortunately, human nature being what it is, that became more important than doing the work that uh, God had called them to do. That makes no sense because religion itself is an ancient belief. That's true. So how could but, they cast uh, one out and uh, cast one out and keep the other? They just try to keep the the positive things that people like and not to bring about the negative parts of it, I suppose. Reverend, I want to thank you very much for joining us tonight, sir. Can you let our listeners know how they can contact you? You can talk, contact me through the website, gargulio.com, G-A-R-G-U-I-L-L-I-O.com, and on there you'll find the link with my email address. You can write with prayer requests or any inquiries, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Reverend, take care of yourself, and a happy new year to you and yours. Happy new year to you, sir. Good night, sir. One eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five is toll free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii. My name is Rob McConnell. Now, when we come back from the news at the top of the hour at six and a half minutes past, we are going to be joined by Jesse Kelsey, and uh, Jesse is an astronumerologist. He's going to be joining us and taking your calls at one eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five. The X Zone is a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction. And fiction is reality. We come to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern right here on the Talk Star Radio Network. I'll be back with Miss Brandy and our next guest, Jesse Kelsey, when we return from the news live from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, right here on Talk Star.